Welcome to the e-textbook of echocardiography in congenital heart diseases. In this module, we are going to discuss the echocardiographic assessment of VSD, ventricular septal defects. We will start with description of a normal ventricular septal anatomy we will tell you about how to image the ventricular septum from different echocardiographic views. Then move on to different types of ventricular septal defects or in other words the anatomic locations of the ventricular septal defects. How to echocardiographically assess them. How to image different types of VSDs in different views. Assess the hemodynamics of the VSD and the associated lesions. Let us start with the basic definitions. The ventricular septal has different portions. The inlet septum is the septum that separates the mitral and the tricuspid valves. It extends basally from the tricuspid annulus and apically it extends up to the attachment of the tricuspid papillary apparatus. The outlet septum or the infundibular septum extends above the superior extent of the septal band up to the pulmonic valve. Trabecular septum is the one that extends caudal to the attachment of the tricuspid leaflets or in other words epical to the attachment of the tricuspid valve leaflets and extends up to the apex and the maximum extent upward is up to the septal band. The last will be the membranous septum which is a relatively small region. It is located at the intersection of the trabecular inlet and outlet regions of the septum. It lies beneath the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve and is in close relation to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve. Even though the anatomic extent of the membranous septum is very small, it's very important because most of the ventricular septal defects occur in the membranous septum. Membranous septum is bounded superiorly by the aortic valve in close relation to the non-coronary cusp and inferiorly by the trabecular septum. The septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and its attachment to the membranous septum divides the membranous septum into two parts. Superiorly it is the atrioventricular part that is above the septal tricuspid leaflet and inferiorly it is the interventricular part that is beneath the septal tricuspid leaflet. But this is a very small area of the whole ventricular septum. In this morphological specimen of the interventricular septum shown after dissecting the right ventricular anterior free wall out of the heart, we can see all the four portions of the ventricular septum here. The septal tricuspid leaflet attachment is shown and there is a black line along the entire attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet. So the inlet ventricular septum starts from this point. You can see yellow dots that are placed along the papillary muscle attachment of the tricuspid valve. The distal extent has been delineated by these yellow dots. So the inlet ventricular septum is located between the septal attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet up to the distal attachment of the tricuspid valve papillary muscles. We can also see the broad septal band the cranial extent of the septal band has been again shown with multiple yellow dots. The outlet septum or the infundibular septum is located above and superior to this septal band. The trabecular septum is the largest portion. All the septum below the outlet septum 
and in front of the inlet septum is going to be the trabecular septum. There is a very small area of the septum which is closely related to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve and immediately below the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve which is called as the membranous septum. So the morphological specimen has been redrawn on a cartoon on the right side of the screen. You can see the septal tricuspid leaflet again drawn, the coronary sinus, the triangle of cock, the tendon of tedero all are shown above the septal tricuspid leaflet attachment. The tricuspid valve cordae and the papillary muscle heads are shown. What is colored in blue is the entire inlet septum. You can also show the septal band shown on the interventricular septum. And what is cranial to the septal band is colored in yellow. And this is the infundibular septum or the outlet septum. The entire interventricular septum that is located anterior to the inlet septum and epical to the outlet septum is the trabecular septum. And this includes the portion where the septal band is lying. You can notice that there is a small area noted with a red color which represents the region of the membranous septum. The membranous septum is closely related to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve and located immediately below the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve. If you carefully look at the membranous septum, a small portion of the membranous septum marked in red is extending above the septal tricuspid leaflet attachment and that portion is called as the pars atrioventricularis that is the atrioventricular septum and the major portion is beneath the septal tricuspid leaflet and below the STL attachment and that is the pars interventricularis or the interventricular portion of the membranous septum. Now, with the advent of three-dimensional echocardiogram, we can recreate images that are similar to the morphology specimens with the utility of volume rendering on the 3D echocardiography. In this movie that is shown, the right ventricular anterior wall has been cropped off and the entire right ventricular septal surface is exposed. In this triangular right ventricular septal surface, you can visualize the tricuspid valve leaflets at the lower end of the image. The place where all the tricuspid valve cordae are getting inserted will define the lower extent of the inlet ventricular septum. You can notice the thick septal band in the middle of the right ventricular septal surface. The septum that is cranial to the upper extent of the septal band is the outlet septum. You can see the bright echogenic area immediately beneath the aortic valve. That area represents the portions of the membranous septum. All the portion of the muscular septum that is caudal to the septal band and that is anterior to the tricuspid valve caudal apparatus will represent the trabecular septum. If we freeze that image, we can show you that the right ventricular septal surface on FAS seen on the volume rendered view is exactly similar to the cartoon that has been described on the right side of the picture. We can now see the portions of the inlet ventricular septum, the outlet ventricular septum, the trabecular septum and the region of the membranous septum. Imaging of the ventricular septum, which is a very complex curved surface, needs a careful assessment using multiple echocardiographic planes or multiple echocardiographic views 
to define the location and extent of the various ventricular septal defects. The commonly used echocardiographic views are subsified short and long axis sweeps, epical four chamber sweep, parasternal long and short axis sweeps. After an assessment is done in all these planes, we can recreate an unfast view of the septum and try to show where the ventricular septal defect is located. We will first start with echocardiographic description of a normal ventricular septum in the next images. In this subsified short axis view, the membranous septum has been shown with an arrow. You can see the tricuspid valve. The membranous septum is closely related to the anteroseptal tricuspid commission and immediately below the aortic valve in the region of the non-coronary cusp. The same membranous septum is marked with an arrow in this epical four chamber view. In epical four chamber view, the membranous septum is visualized immediately beneath the aortic valve leaflets. On a parasternal short axis view, the membranous septum is seen immediately below the aortic valve leaflets and in very close relation to the septal tricuspid leaflet. It has been shown with an arrow. For a comparison, the outlet septum is also shown. In this parasternal short axis view, the membranous septum occupies the 9 to 10 o'clock position of the aortic valve and the outflow septum is between 11 to 1 o'clock position of the aortic valve. In this 3D echocardiography, volume rendered view of the right ventricular septal surface, the membranous septum has been pointed with four arrows. The area of the ventricular septum that is located within the, air, within the region of the four arrows is the membranous septum. For the sake of understanding, we have also put the inlet ventricular septum and the outlet ventricular septum's extent with dots. In this still frame of 3D echocardiography, the region of the membranous septum is clearly pointed out. On the adjacent cartoon, the membranous septum is located in the region which is colored red. Let us now move on to the inlet septum. The inlet septum is the region of the ventricular septum that is located between the mitral and the tricuspid valves. The cranial extent of the inlet septum is at the region of the attachment of septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve to the ventricular septum. On a subsified short axis view, the two arrows show the extent of the inlet septum. In an epical four chamber view, the inlet septum is located below the attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet. On a 3D echocardiogram, volume rendered view of the right ventricular septal surface, if we have to point the extent of the inlet ventricular septum, this is how it is being done. The four arrows point to the region which is the complete extent of the inlet ventricular septum. It extends between the attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet to the attachment of the septal papillary muscles to the interventricular septum. On a still frame of the echocardiography, the four arrows point to the complete extent of the in inlet portion of the ventricular septum. 
Let us now move on to the trabecular septum or the muscular septum. In a subsified short axis view, we will see the muscular septum between the right and the left ventricle. The echogenic structure that runs through the cavity of the right ventricle from the intraventricular septum towards the right ventricular anterior free wall is called as the moderator band, noted in this echo as MB. This portion represents the mid-muscular septum. On an apical four chamber view, the muscular septum is located in the region shown with the arrow. The trabecular muscular septum extends to a large extent. On a parasternal long axis view, the mid-muscular septum is shown with this arrow. The different portions of the muscular septum or the trabecular septum is shown in this parasternal short axis view. You can see the anterior muscular septum which is closer to the anterior intraventricular groove. The posterior muscular septum which is close to the posterior intraventricular groove and the mid muscular septum which is between the anterior and the posterior muscular septum. On the same parasternal short axis view, if we make a cut at the more apical portion of the ventricle, we will see the apical muscular septum. The apical muscular septum is the septum that is seen in the most apical portion of the left ventricle. On a parasternal long axis view, when we visualize the entire left ventricle, the aortic valve and the mitral valve, the most apical portion of the interventricular septum is also called as the epicoinfundibular septum. Ventricular septal defects located in this location will be actually anterior muscular ventricular septal defects. This portion is also called as the epicoinfundibular septum. Once again, in this 3D echo ca cartoon, we can see that the trabecular septum is located below the inlet septum and below the outlet septum. The septal band, which is also called as the septomarginal trabeculation, is shown as a T-like structure. It has got a vertical limb and a horizontal limb. The horizontal limb is more cranially located and the vertical limb is epically located. The trabecular septum is the portion of ventricular septum that has not been colored in this cartoon. The outlet septum is colored with yellow. The inlet septum is colored blue. Membranous septum is colored red. And the trabecular septum is left uncolored. You can see the septal band, the T-shaped septal band, which has got a horizontal cranial portion and a vertical caudal portion. Let us now move on to the outlet septum. On a subsified short axis view, you can identify a small ridge or a small elevation on the right ventricular septal surface. This represents the septal band or trabeculo marginalis. The portion of the ventricular septum that is cranial to this septal band is the outlet septum. On a parasternal long axis view, after visualizing the iota and the mitral valve, if you make a gentle leftward sweep towards the right ventricular outflow tract, 
the septum that is visualized is the outflow septum. This is pointed out with an arrow. In fact, on a parasternal long axis view, if you are able to very clearly identify the ventricular septal defect below the aortic root, those ventricular septal defects are outlet ventricular septal defects. This is a parasternal short axis view. In this parasternal short axis view, in relation to the left ventricular outflow tract, the outflow septum can be seen at around 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock position. The membranous septum, as described earlier, will be seen at around 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock position. On this 3D echocardiography, the right ventricular septal surface, we have marked the septal band with a T-shaped structure. The entire ventricular septum that is located cranial to the horizontal portion of the septal band is called as the outflow septum. The outflow septum extends up to the pulmonic valve. On this still frame, you can notice the T-shaped septal band and the entire portion of the septum that is located above the horizontal portion of the septal band represents the outflow septum and it is represented on the adjacent cartoon with yellow color. If we have to recreate the ventricular septal defect on fast on the right ventricular septal surface on a cartoon, we can draw a picture of the entire right ventricular septal surface and try to locate the ventricular septal defect in relation to the known portion of the interventricular septum. What is pointed out on the cartoon in position number 9 is the membrane septum. There is a small band of tissue immediately above the region of the membrane septum. This is called as the ventriculo infundibular fold or crista supraventricularis. A membranous VSD is also called as infracrystal VSD because it is located below this crista. The portion that has been described as number four is the septal band. Eight refers to outlet septum, two refers to inlet septum. 3 refers to the apical septum. The septal band which is shown as number 4 is a broad muscular band that is seen on the middle of the trabecular septum. The moderator band connects the right ventricular anterior wall to the caudal end of the septal band. The moderator band is shown as number 5. The moderator band gets attached to the base of the anterior papillary muscles. The anterior papillary muscle of the tricuspid valve is shown as number 2. Number 7 refers to the anterior margin of the ventricular septum. Number 6 refers to the portion which is called as the epicoinfundibular septum. On 3D echocardiography, all these portions can be shown and we can reconstruct the entire interventricular septal surface as viewed from the RV as in this picture. On this still frame of 3D echocardiography, all the portions of the ventricular septum 
are shown the inlet septum the trabecular septum the outlet septum and the membranous septum there are various types of classifications of ventricular septal defects professor robert anderson makes the following classification number 1 perimembranous ventricular septal defect number 2 muscular ventricular septal defects number 3 doubly committed or juxta arterial ventricular septal defects and number 4 inlet ventricular septal defects and these are shown on the adjacent cartoon in different places dr richard van praag has another set of classification of ventricular septal defects defects are called conal septal defect conoventricular septal defects atrioventricular canal type of defects muscular ventricular septal defects which may be further categorized into anterior ventricular mid ventricular posterior ventricular and apical ventricular septal defects let us move on to the individual types of ventricular septal defects the perimembranous ventricular septal defect is classically related to two anatomic structures number 1 the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve number 2 the non coronary cusp of the aortic valve these defects will be located immediately below the ventriculo infundibular fold or cresta supraventricularis the ventriculo infundibular fold is the posterior fascicle of the horizontal band the superior end of the septal band we pointed out earlier that the septal band is a t shaped structure with a horizontal part and a vertical part the horizontal part has got an anterior extension and a posterior extension the anterior extension courses towards the anterior ventricular septal margin the posterior extension courses towards the aortic annulus in the region of right fibrous trigone membranous ventricular septal defects are located immediately below this ventriculo infundibular fold which is also called as the crista supraventricularis and that is one of the reason why perimembranous vsd will be described as infra crystal vsd in some schools of morphology on a subsified short axis view a perimembranous vsd is closely related to the anteroseptal tricuspid commission or the commissure between the anterior tricuspid leaflet and septal tricuspid leaflet for the sake of understanding in this cartoon we have marked the anterior posterior and septal leaflet as ap and s you can notice that the location of the ventricular septal defect is closely related to the anteroseptal commission this is the classic location of a perimembranous ventricular septal defect we have to very clearly understand that all membranous ventricular septal defects should be in close relation to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve we can see the anterior leaflet which is the largest leaflet of the tricuspid valve very well and noted as a the septal tricuspid leaflet is a smaller leaflet and is mostly adherent to the inlet portion of the ventricular septum the anteroseptal commissure is closely related to the membranous ventricular septal defects it is also located immediately beneath the non coronary cusp of the aortic valve on this subsified short axis view 
the color doppler echocardiogram shows the flow of blood from the left ventricle to right ventricle through a perimembranous ventricular septal defect notice that the color jet is located immediately below the non coronary cusp of the aortic valve we can see that the color jet is coursing in two directions as two jets it's quite common to have a perimembranous ventricular septal defect jet being split into two or three jets by the various caudal attachment from the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve to the margins of the ventricular septal defect on an apical view after we visualize the mitral and the tricuspid valves if we sweep anteriorly to get the aortic valve that is moving from a four chamber to five chamber view during the transition we will be able to visualize the classical perimembranous ventricular septal defect the color doppler in the same view shows the flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricle through the perimembranous ventricular septal defect it is important to notice that all the perimembranous ventricular septal defects will be visualized when we move from the four chamber view anteriorly towards the five chamber view on a parasternal long axis view a classic perimembranous vsd will not be seen very well a perimembranous vsd is located a little bit more to the right side and so on a parasternal long axis view it will be difficult to visualize a perimembranous vsd very well if a ventricular septal defect is visualized very well on a parasternal long axis view below the aortic valve leaflets it means either the membranous vsd has got an outlet extension or the vsd is an outlet vsd in the same parasternal long axis view when we do a color doppler interrogation we are not able to appreciate the flow of blood through the ventricular septal defect from lv to rv we need to understand that a perimembranous vsd without an extension to the outlet septum should not be seen well on a parasternal long axis view when we are visualizing the entire aortic valve mitral valve and the left ventricle on a parasternal short axis view it is easy to identify a perimembranous vsd in relation to the aortic root the perimembranous ventricular septal defects will be seen in a 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock direction the septal tricuspid leaflet will get attached roughly to the 9 o'clock position of the aortic root and the perimembranous ventricular septal defect will extend anywhere from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock position on a parasternal short axis view after we visualize the aortic valve if we make a sweep a little bit towards the apex caudally we'll be able to expose the perimembranous ventricular septal defect we can see in this view a large perimembranous vsd located below the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve when a color doppler interrogation on a parasternal short axis view is done we notice that the ventricular septal defects color flow is seen between the 9 to 11 o'clock position of the aortic root after visualizing the aortic valve we need to tilt the probe a little bit towards the apex to visualize the entire perimembranous ventricular septal defect on this 3d echocardiogram we can see the septal band the septal band has been shown as a t shape there is a horizontal limb 
and there is a vertical limb. The horizontal limb has got an anterior division and a posterior division. The posterior division is shown with two arrows. This portion is called as the ventriculo-infundibular fold. It's also called as crista supraventricularis. A typical perimembranous VSD is located caudal or apical to this ventriculo-infundibular fold. That is one of the reasons why a perimembranous ventricular septal defect is also called as infracrystal ventricular septal defect. In this 3D echocardiogram, the pulmonary artery, the iota, right atrium and right ventricle have been named. The two arrows point to the perimembranous ventricular septal defect which is located in close relation to the anteroseptal tricuspid commissure and below the crista supraventricularis or ventriculo infundibular fold. If this ventriculo infundibular fold is very well developed, if the crista supraventricularis is very well developed, it separates the margins of the ventricular septal defect a little bit away from the aortic annulus. In patients in whom the ventriculo infundibular fold is not well formed at all, the margins of the ventricular septal defect will be abutting the aortic annulus. This is one of the reasons why some of the membranous ventricular septal defects will have a separation from the aortic valve annulus and some of them will be very closely related to the aortic valve annulus. It is the separation of some of these ventricular septal defects from the aortic annulus that makes some of these defects amenable for a transcatheter device closure. If the ventricular septal defects are very close to the aortic annulus and abutting the aortic valve leaflets, the options of closure of these perimembranous ventricular septal defects with transcatheter methods may be limited. On this 3D echocardiogram, we demonstrate a large ventricular septal defect. The ventricular septal defect is located in the membranous location. You can see a strand of tricuspid valve tissue, a strand of the caudal tissue of the tricuspid valve from the anteroseptal commissure crossing the ventricular septal defect and getting attached to its anterior margin. These represent the conal muscles of Lancisi. Some of the cordae from the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve may straddle across the ventricular septal defect and get attached to the anterior margins of the ventricular septal defect. You can also notice in this patient that the ventriculo infundibular fold or the crista supraventricularis is very well developed and so the VSD is marginally separated from the aortic annulus. There is a muscular rim that is separating the ventricular septal defect from the aortic annulus. Perimembranous ventricular septal defects can be restricted by formation of a septal aneurysmal tissue by tissues from the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Sometimes it can be restricted by prolapse of the aortic valve leaflets. More commonly the non-coronary cusp and less commonly the right coronary cusp. The effective size of the ventricular septal defect can be made smaller by either of these two mechanisms. This subsified short axis view shows a membranous septal defect which is closely related to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve. We can appreciate the anterior and the septal tricuspid leaflets very well. However, the anatomic size of the ventricular septal defect is smaller in comparison to the aortic annulus. The size of the ventricular septal defect is often co compared to the aortic annulus.
if the VSD is almost as large or larger than the aortic annulus, it is called non-restrictive large ventricular septal defects. If they are much more smaller than the aortic annulus, they are called restrictive membranous septal defects. We can see that in this example, there is a substantial restriction of the size of the ventricular septal defect by the leaflet tissues from the septal tricuspid leaflet. When we do a color Doppler interrogation on the same subsified short axis view, we can notice that the color jet of ventricular septal defect from the LV into the right ventricle is very small. It is narrow because of restriction from the septal tricuspid leaflet tissues. When we visualize the same restrictive perimembranous VSD from the apical view, we can find that the septal tricuspid leaflet tissue forms a septal aneurysm which is called as membranous septal aneurysm around the margins of the ventricular septal defect. On color imaging, we can notice that this perimembranous VSD which is located below the aortic annulus is significantly restricted in its size by this membranous septal aneurysm. The same epical view has been magnified to demonstrate the relation between the perimembranous VSD to the aortic annulus. We can notice that the membranous septal aneurysm formed from the septal tricuspid leaflets is in fact separating the margins of the perimembranous VSD away from the aortic annulus. This makes most of the restrictive perimembranous VSDs amenable for non-surgical device closures. Even though a classical perimembranous VSD is not visualized on a parasternal long axis view when we see the entire left ventricle, aortic valve and the mitral valve, if we make a rightward sweep from the standard parax, parasternal long axis view, we will be able to visualize the perimembranous VSD. In the same view, a color Doppler interrogation shows the ventricular septal defect jet. The flow is from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. The membranous septal aneurysm that has been formed from the septal tricuspid leaflet which restricts the size of the perimembranous VSD is actually separating the VSD margins away from the aortic annulus thereby giving the VSD an aortic margin. On a parasternal short axis view, a perimembranous ventricular septal defect is located between the 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock position of the aortic root. A color Doppler interrogation of this restrictive perimembranous VSD in parasternal short axis view shows a narrow color jet which is indicative of truly restrictive size of the defect. In order to measure the size of a perimembranous VSD, we have to choose a frozen frame in diastole where the dimensions of the VSD will be the largest. We should not try to measure the color width as the color width may overestimate or underestimate the size of the ventricular septal defect depending on the color gains and the color velocity Nyquist limits. The interventricular gradient, the gradient between the left ventricle and the right ventricle will be an indicator of the size of the ventricular septal defects. In restrictive perimembranous VSD, the interventricular gradient will be more than 4 meter per second. In this instance, 
it is 74 millimeters of mercury which indicates the restrictive size of the ventricular septal defect. Perimembranous ventricular septal defects may have prolapse of the non-coronary aortic cusp or less commonly the right coronary aortic cusp and they may have frequent abnormalities of the aortic commissure between the right coronary and the non-coronary cusps. The mechanism of prolapse is due to venturi effect. It is due to sucking of the thin leaflets into the right ventricle due to a high pressure ventricular septal defect jet from left ventricle to right ventricle. In this parasternal long axis view, the aortic valve is seen, the anterior cusp of the aortic valve, namely the right coronary cusp, is shown to prolapse into the ventricular septal defect. This is an example of right coronary cusp prolapse into the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. When the prolapse of the right coronary cusp is very minimal, the aortic valve function will not be affected and there may not be an aortic regurgitation at all. On the short axis view in this patient with a perimembranous ventricular septal defect, the color jet from the ventricular septal defect is seen at 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock position of the aortic root, thereby indicating the membranous location. We can notice the prolapse of the right coronary cusp very close to the commissure between the right and the non-coronary cusps. This has resulted in a trivial aortic regurgitation which is a small diastolic color seen in the center of the aortic valve cusps. In some instances, even when the prolapse of the right coronary or non-coronary cusp is very significant, there may not be a proportionately severe aortic regurgitation. In this instance, even though there is a substantial prolapse of the right coronary cusp, which restricts the size of the ventricular septal defect to a very small size, there is no aortic regurgitation. An epical view of a perimembranous ventricular septal defect with right coronary cusp prolapse. We can notice the right coronary cusp having a significant prolapse and deformity. The prolapse of the right coronary cusp also limits the size of the ventricular septal defect. When the right coronary cusp prolapse is very significant, the free edge of the right coronary cusp sags below the other leaflet's free edge and this results in an aortic regurgitation that is posteriorly directed towards the mitral leaflet. The aortic regurgitation jet that is caused by a right coronary cusp prolapse will be posteriorly directed towards the anterior mitral leaflet. As the membranous septum is very closely related to the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve, non-coronary cusp prolapse is more common in membranous defects. This is an example of a non-coronary cusp prolapse through the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. You can also notice that there is a very minimal prolapse and deformity of the right coronary cusp. The differentiation between a non-coronary cusp and a right coronary cusp on a parasternal long axis view will be the anterior location of the right coronary cusp and posterior location of the non-coronary cusp. The non-coronary cusp will be in relation to the mitral valve. The right coronary cusp 
will be the most anterior cusp. When there is a prolapse of the non-coronary cusp, the aortic regurgitation jet will be directed anteriorly towards the intraventricular septum. In this patient, we can see that the VST jet is directed from LV to the RV and the aortic regurgitation jet that is arising from the non-coronary cusp prolapse is also anteriorly directed. On a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the perimembranous VSD in the 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock position of the aortic root. The VSD is in close relation to the septal tricuspid leaflet. We can notice that the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp both are prolapsing into the VSD and the VSD is located in the region of the non-coronary right coronary commission. In the parasternal short axis view, when there is a substantial non-coronary cusp prolapse, we can notice that the aortic regurgitation is happening all around the free edge of the non-coronary cusp. When we visualize the perimembranous ventricular septal defect, associated with aortic valve prolapse on a transesophageal echocardiogram, we need to get into the short axis of the left ventricular outflow tract. This is often achieved at an angle of around 30 to 45 degrees on the multiplane transesophageal echo. We can notice that the color jet from the left ventricle enters the right ventricular inflow region the perimembranous ventricular septal defect, the color jet is visualized at around 7 to 8 o'clock position in relation to the aortic root. There is also a minimal prolapse of both the non-coronary and right coronary cusps. This will be best appreciated when we visualize the leaflets on the long axis. When we expose the aortic valve in its long axis, which is obtained at around 110 to 120 degree of the multiplane transesophageal echocardiogram, we can appreciate the prolapse of both the right coronary and non-coronary cusps through the ventricular septal defect. The non-coronary cusp is the posterior cusp and so on a transesophageal echo is seen closer to the transducer. The right coronary cusp is the anterior cusp and so is seen farther away from the transducer. Unlike many other aortic valve diseases which causes aortic regurgitation like rheumatic aortic valve regurgitation, the aortic regurgitation caused by non-coronary cusp prolapse and right coronary cusp prolapse cause a very eccentric aortic regurgitation. This often results in significant underestimation of the severity of aortic regurgitation. Whenever the right coronary cusp is prolapsing, we will have an aortic regurgitation that is directed posteriorly towards the anterior mitral leaflet. However, whenever there is a non-coronary cusp prolapse, the aortic regurgitation jet will be directed anteriorly towards the intraventricular septum. In this example, on a parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate that the aortic regurgitation caused by non-coronary cusp prolapse, the jet is directed anteriorly. We can also notice the color mosaic seen in the right ventricle due to the color jet across the ventricular septal defect from left ventricle to right ventricle. Also notice a dilated coronary sinus which indicates the presence of persistence of left superior vena cava draining through the coronary sinus into the right atrium. This is a magnified view of the parasternal short axis view. The entire left ventricular outflow tract 
immediately below the aortic valve leaflets has been magnified. The ventricular septal defect is seen at around 9 o'clock position in relation to the aortic root. We can appreciate that there is a significant prolapse of the non-coronary cusp through the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. We need to appreciate very clearly that whenever the non-coronary cusp is prolapsing, non-coronary cusp being a posterior cusp, the aortic regurgitation jet will be directed anteriorly. You can see in the example, the non-coronary cusp is prolapsing and that results in an aortic regurgitation jet that is directed anteriorly towards the left ventricular outflow tract. To summarize, perimembranous ventricular septal defect may be associated with non-coronary aortic cusp prolapse or right coronary aortic cusp prolapse or a combination of both non-coronary and right coronary aortic cusp prolapse. Whenever there is a non-coronary cusp prolapse, the aortic regurgitation that may result due to this prolapse will be directed anteriorly towards the left ventricular outflow tract. Whenever there is a right coronary cusp prolapse, the aortic regurgitation jet resulting from the right coronary cusp prolapse will be directed posteriorly towards the anterior mitral leaflet. Now let us see a patient with a perimembranous septal defect which forms a membranous septal aneurysm due to ingrowth of tissues from all around the ventricular septal defect margins. This ingrowth of tissue from the ventricular septal defect margins may result in the actual jet getting displaced away from the aortic annulus or in other words this creates an aortic margin for a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. To differentiate these defects from a high muscular ventricular septal defect or a ventricular septal defect located very high in the trabecular muscular septum we need to identify the relationship between this ventricular septal defect and the anteroseptal tricuspid commission. If the ventricular septal defect is in very close relation to the anteroseptal tricuspid commission, it is still called as a perimembranous VSD, even though there may be a separation from the aortic annulus. When we magnify into the same apical view, the region of the ventricular septal defect, we can notice that there is a moderate sized membranous ventricular septal defect with a good left to right shunt. However, there is a distinct margin that separates the ventricular septal defect from the aortic annulus. When there is such a distinct margin from the aortic annulus, these ventricular septal defects can safely be closed with occluder devices. There are a variety of occluder devices that are suited for this location. We can use the asymmetric membranous or symmetric membranous VSD occluders. We can use the duct occluders 1 or duct occluders 2. Sometimes we can even use a muscular ventricular septal defect. In this example, we have shown a large perimembranous ventricular septal defect being closed by a duct occluder 1 device. You can notice that there is no residual flow across the ventricular septal defect and there is a very tiny trivial whiff of grade 1 tricuspid regurgitation. You can notice an extremely close relationship between the tricuspid valve leaflets and the device which indicates that the ventricular septal defect was truly a membranous defect. While describing the ventricular septal anatomy using three dimensional echocardiogram and volume rendering of the RV septal surface, in the previous slides, in, the, in this particular slide, we are utilizing the same 3D technology.
to demonstrate the location of the duct occluder device that has been used to close the perimembranous ventricular receptacle defect. We can see the duct occluder device which is appearing as a shiny white device in very close relation to the anteroceptral commissure located immediately below the aortic valve cusps. After a complete description of the various types of perimembranous ventricular septal defect, which are the commonest type of ventricular septal defects, let us move on to the outlet VSDs. Outlet VSDs are defects that are located superior to the horizontal limb of the septal band. There are various different types of outlet VSDs. Some may be called the subpulmonic VSD, some are intraconal VSD, some are very large and committed to both the aortic and pulmonary valve and they are called the doubly committed subarterial VSDs. Let us see examples of all these individual types. Among the different types of outlet VSDs, subpulmonary VSD refers to ventricular septal defects which closely abut the pulmonic valve. In the region of the outflow septum, if the ventricular septal defect is forming the extremely close relation to the pulmonary, pulmonary annulus and the VSD margins merge with the pulmonary annulus, they are called subpulmonic ventricular septal defects. When we visualize the subpulmonary VSDs in subsified short axis view, we can notice that these defects are at the most cranial location. When we carefully see the right ventricular side of the interventricular septum, we can notice a small ridge of protrusion of the interventricular septum which represents the horizontal limb of the septal band. By definition, a subpulmonary VSD is located cranial to this horizontal limb of the septal band. You can notice the 2D dropout of the ventricular septum in the region of subpulmonary ventricular septal defect. When we utilize color Doppler interrogation, we will appreciate that the subpulmonary ventricular septal defect on subcostal short axis view are very very cranially located and the color jet is very close to the pulmonic valve. They often take a blue hue because the flow of blood from the left ventricle to right ventricle across the subpulmonary VSD will be away from the transducer in this subsified view. Parasternal long axis view are the best views for identifying a subpulmonary ventricular septal defect. In this view, the defect is located immediately below the aortic annulus and so are very easy to appreciate. By utilizing a color, color flows, we can appreciate the color jet from the left ventricle into the right ventricle across this subpulmonary ventricular septal defect. Many of the subpulmonary ventricular septal defect may get anatomically restricted by prolapse of the right coronary cusp even though there may not be any aortic regurgitation as in this example. On a subsified short axis view, the subpulmonary ventricular septal defects will be located in the region of 1 o'clock in relation to the left ventricular outflow tract. They will be located immediately below the pulmonary valve and there won't be a separation between the pulmonary valve leaflets and the margins of this ventricular septal defect. We can notice the color jet across a subpulmonary VSD coursing from the left ventricle into the right ventricle immediately beneath the pulmonary valve. We can appreciate the movement of the pulmonary valve leaflets 
and also a small whiff of pulmonary regurgitation that is visualized in diastole. Many subpulmonary VSDs will be associated with significant right coronary cusp prolapse. In fact, in the oriental population, the incidence of subpulmonary VSDs are more common than in Caucasian population. And in this oriental group, it has been observed that on follow-up, as many as 50% of the patients will have right coronary cusp prolapse, resulting in various degrees of aortic regurgitation. In the previous example, with significant right coronary cusp prolapse, we can notice a moderate aortic regurgitation. The aortic regurgitation jet is very eccentric and it hits on the posterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract represented by the anterior mitral leaflet. Since these jets are very eccentric, it is very easy to underestimate the severity of the aortic regurgitation. However, a substantial LV dilatation and an associated flow reversal in diastole in the thoracic and abdominal iota will indicate the severity of the aortic regurgitation. Another example of a patient with subpulmonary ventricular septal defect seen on parasternal long axis view with more significant aortic regurgitation. The aortic regurgitation severity can also be assessed by measuring the vena contracta. The vena contracta refers to the narrowest color width at its origin. If the vena contracta is between 5 to 6 millimeters, it indicates often a severe aortic regurgitation. In this 3D ANFAS view of the RV septal surface, white dots have been placed along the horizontal band of the trabeculoseptomarginalis or in other words the horizontal division of the septal band. As we described earlier, the outflow septum refers to the entire area of the ventricular septum above this horizontal division of the septal band. We can see the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve being noted by their annotations. Immediately below the aortic valve and in close proximity to the pulmonic valve leaflets, we can identify a moderate sized subpulmonary VSD. This is the clear anatomic location of a subpulmonic VSD on the RV on fast view. In a frozen frame from the previous 3D echocardiogram, we are showing the location of the subpulmonary ventricular septal defect immediately below the pulmonary valve leaflets. The adjacent cartoon shows the location of the subpulmonary VS defect. After a description about the subpulmonary ventricular septal defect, let us move on to intraconal ventricular septal defect. The difference between a subpulmonary ventricular septal defect and intraconal ventricular septal defect is the separation of the ventricular septal defect margins from the pulmonary annulus. If an outlet VSD is in very close relation to the pulmonic annulus, and there is no margin that is separating the ventricular septal defect from the pulmonary valve annulus. They are called subpulmonary VSDs. However, if there is a good margin that is separating the outlet ventricular septal defects from the pulmonary valve margin, they are called intraconal ventricular septal defects, sometimes shortly called as conal ventricular septal defects. These defects will have a short muscular rim all around it. 
In this subsified short axis view, there is a ventricular septal defect immediately below the aortic valve leaflets. When we are visualizing the VSD color jet, we don't see portions of the tricuspid valve leaflets at all. And so, this ventricular septal defect is not in relation to the tricuspid valve. However, it is far away from the pulmonic valve also. So these defects refer to as intraconal defects. They are located in the outflow septum but separated well from the pulmonary valve annulus. In an apical five chamber view with a further anterior sweep, we will be able to appreciate this intraconal VST. The tricuspid valve leaflets are not visualized at all and so it clearly indicates that this is not a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. Once again, on a parasternal long axis view, an intraconal ventricular septal defect can easily be recognized. This is the characteristic hallmark of all the outlet VSDs. All the outlet VSDs will be easily be appreciated on a parasternal long axis view immediately below the aortic annulus. The color flow across the intraconal ventricular septal defect is easily appreciated on a parasternal long axis view and is shown by an arrow. On a short axis view, we can notice a short muscular rim that is separating the margins of this ventricular septal defect shown by an arrow from the pulmonary valve leaflets. It is the separation from the pulmonary valve leaflets by a short muscular rim that makes it distinctive as intraconal ventricular septal defects. In this parasternal short axis view, the ventricular septal defect is located between the 11 to 12 o'clock location of the left ventricular outflow tract. There is a very clear margin that separates this outlet ventricular septal defect from the pulmonary valve annulus. This is the most distinctive feature of an intraconal defect. The reason why we are differentiating these intraconal ventricular septal defects from the subpulmonary ventricular septal defects is to make a clear appreciation of the muscular rim that is separating these defects from the pulmonary annulus. So these intraconal ventricular septal defects may be amenable for a transcathedral closure like the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. We can notice the color flow across the intraconal defect in around 12 o'clock location from the left ventricular outflow tract into the right ventricular outflow tract. On a three-dimensional unfast view of the RV septal surface, this intraconal ventricular septal defect can be identified by the region of the color entry into the right ventricular outflow tract. It is shown by the small yellow dots and noted by the arrow also. You can see the separation of an intraconal ventricular septal defect from the pulmonary valve leaflets which is located a little bit above. On a volume rendered 3D on first view of the RV septal surface, the dropout of the intraconal ventricular septal defect is very clearly identified immediately below the aortic valve leaflet but is well separated from the pulmonary valve leaflet. You can see a short punched out defect noted by an arrow indicating the location of the intraconal ventricular septal defect. We move on to the last type of outlet ventricular septal defect which is also called doubly committed or large subarterial ventricular septal defects. 
these defects are very large and they are confluent with the aortic and pulmonary annulus. In fact, in these patients, there is no outlet septum at all. And the entire outlet septum is absent, causing a large subarterial defect. On this subsified short axis view, you can notice a large defect immediately below the pulmonic valve. The size of the ventricular septal defect is almost comparable to the dilated pulmonary annulus. This total lack of the outlet septum is what is described as a doubly committed large subarterial ventricular septal defect. Since these doubly committed ventricular septal defects are very large, they are often associated with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension and the right ventricular and left ventricular systolic pressures will be very similar. You can notice a laminar blue flow from the left ventricle entering the pulmonic outflow tract without any turbulence because the left ventricle and pulmonary artery pressures are almost similar. This is a common feature of most of the large subarterial VSDs, which are also called as doubly committed VSDs. Since a doubly committed large subarterial VSD is located below the pulmonary annulus, it will not be possible to recognize this VSD in an apical view which shows both the AV valves. A large doubly committed VSD is much more anterior in location and so they will not be visualized on an apical four chamber view. However, when we get into an apical five chamber view by an anterior tilt, and include the aortic annulus, will be able to appreciate a large sub-arterial ventricular septal defect. Color Doppler echocardiogram in this epical five chamber view shows the large left right shunt through the sub-arterial ventricular septal defect. As we described earlier, parastinal long axis view is going to immediately expose this large doubly committed ventricular septal defects. By definition, all the outlet VSDs are best visualized from the parastinal long axis view. Since all the doubly committed ventricular septal defects are very large, there is no pressure difference between the left ventricle and right ventricle and the flow across the intraventricular septum will be laminar and will not show any major turbulence or a mosaic pattern. On a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate a very large doubly committed VSD immediately below the aortic valve in the left ventricular outflow tract and below the pulmonary well, the VSD almost occupies from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the region of the left ventricular outflow tract. Color Doppler in the parasternal law short axis view shows laminar flows across this large subarterial doubly committed ventricular septal defects. You can notice the pulmonary valve leaflets and there is no separation of the ventricular septal defect margins from the pulmonary annulus. In this 3D unfast view on the right ventricular septal surface, you can notice the thick horizontal division of the septal band and a large subarterial doubly committed VSD is seen in the region of the entire outlet septum. We can see the pulmonary valve leaflets and the aortic valve leaflets and below the aortic and pulmonary valve leaflets there is no outlet septum at all and the whole thing is now 
a doubly committed subarterial ventricular septal defect. In these patients with a doubly committed ventricular septal defect, the aortic annulus and the pulmonary annulus are in very close proximity to each other. There is no conal septum that separates the pulmonary annulus out away from the aortic annulus as in a normal heart. After the perimembranous and outlet ventricular septal defects, let us now move on to the inlet ventricular septal defects. Inlet ventricular septal defects are defects that are located in the inlet septum which are guarded posteriorly by the septal tricuspid annulus and anteriorly by the papillary muscle attachments of the tricuspid valve. They are located posterior and inferior to the membranous septum and they are beneath the septal tricuspid leaflet of the tricuspid valve. On a subsified short axis view, we are able to appreciate the mitral valve leaflets in the left ventricle and the tricuspid valve leaflets in the right ventricle. Between the two lies the inlet ventricular septum. We can appreciate a large ventricular septal defect in this example. We can notice that there are a lot of tricuspid valve, caudal and papillary tissues in the region of the ventricular septal defect. Most of the inlet ventricular septal defect will be associated with straddling of either of the atrioventricular valves and hence it is very common to see the caudal apparatus of either one of the atrioventricular valve in the region of the inlet ventricular septum. In this subsified short axis view, we can appreciate the ventricular septal defect even better. There is a small margin of tissue that is separating the ventricular septal defect from the aortic annulus. The defect is located between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. As the anatomic size of this ventricular septal defect is very large, much more larger than the aortic annulus, there is a bidirectional flow across this ventricular septal defect. We can see both left to right and right to left flows between the left and the right ventricles. On a subsified coronal view, we can appreciate the inlet ventricular septal defect and portions of the tricuspid valve leaflets getting attached to the crest of the interventricular septum. There may be grade 1 or grade 2 straddling in many of these patients with inlet ventricular septal defect of either one of the atrioventricular valves. On a color Doppler interrogation, on the same subsified coronal view, we can notice the bidirectional flow. We need to compare the anatomic size of the ventricular septal defect with that of the aortic annulus to decide on its non-restrictive nature. We can appreciate that the size of the ventricular septal defect is much larger than the aortic annulus in this situation and hence the inlet VSD is a very large ventricular septal defect. Epical four chamber view is the best view to identify septal defects located in the inlet septum. Once we appreciate the mitral and the tricuspid valves, the septum that is lying between the two atrioventricular valves will represent the inlet ventricular septum. We can appreciate a large inlet ventricular septal defect. As described in the previous slides, we can also notice that there is a lot of caudal attachment of the tricuspid valves to the crest of the interventricular septum. If the attachment of one of the atrioventricular valve is confined to the crest of the ventricular septal defects, then it is called grade 1 straddling. 
if the caudal tissue are getting attached to the opposite side of the ventricular septum which means the tricuspid valve cordae are getting attached to the left side of the ventricular septum or the mitral valve cordae is getting attached to the right side of the ventricular septum then they are called grade 2 straddling of the AV valves. Grade 3 straddling refers to crossover of the AV valve cordae to the opposite free wall. So if there is a grade 3 straddling of the tricuspid valve, the tricuspid valve cordae will be attached to the free wall of the left ventricle. Similarly, if there is a grade 3 straddling of the mitral valve, there will be mitral valve cordae that will be attached to the free wall of the right ventricle. To identify the straddling, we can magnify the region of the ventricular septal defect and carefully analyze the caudal attachment of the atrioventricular valve. We can clearly appreciate the attachment of a few of the cordae of the tricuspid valve to the crest of the ventricular septal defect. This is indicative of straddling of the tricuspid valve. We can also appreciate that there is a large second atrial septal defect between the right and the left atrium. In this epical view, we notice that the flow of blood across the inlet ventricular septal defect is bidirectional, indicative of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. When we look into the three-dimensional echocardiogram of this inlet ventricular septal defect, we notice that these defects are highly hidden by the septal tricuspid leaflet. We can appreciate the tricuspid valve leaflets here. The caudal structures are seen as threads that emerge from the septal leaflets towards the ventricular septum. And between the caudal leaflets, we can appreciate the large inlet ventricular septal defect. It's partially hidden by the multiple caudal attachments from the tricuspid valve to the ventricular septum. In this 3D on-fast view of the right ventricular septal surface, we have denoted the region of the inlet ventricular septal defect with multiple dots. We can appreciate the inlet ventricular septal defect hidden by the different caudal apparatus from the tricuspid valve which all gain attachments to the crest of the ventricular septal defect. We can also notice that the size of the ventricular septal defect is much larger than the aortic annulus indicating that the VSD is very large. The other portions of the ventricular septum namely the trabecular septum and the outlet septum which is located above the horizontal division of the septal band are very clearly seen. The pulmonary valve is also seen on fast. In a frozen frame of the 3D on fast view from the previous slide, we have noted the position of the inlet ventricular septal defect. The inlet VSD is indicated by a series of white dots on the 3D on fast view. The adjacent cartoon denotes the actual extent of the entire intraventricular septum. After the inlet ventricular septal defects, we move on to the trabecular ventricular septal defects or the muscular ventricular septal defects. These are defects in the trabecular septum. They are described based on their position as anterior muscular, mid-muscular, posterior muscular or epical muscular. Sometimes they are also named as anterior marginal and posterior marginal. If they are very close to the margins of the intraventricular septum. They are classified depending on the number of the defects as single or multiple. Sometimes these defects may be too small but appear like a sieve and in such case they are described as Swiss cheese defects. <laughs> 
muscular septal defects can be grouped as small and restrictive or large depending on the comparative sizes of the ventricular septal defect with that of the aortic annulus. Now we will move on to some illustrative examples of different types of trabecular muscular ventricular septal defects. In this subsified short axis view, we identify a moderate sized ventricular septal defect in the high muscular septum. When we look at the tricuspid valve apparatus, we are not able to see the valve leaflets, but only the caudal apparatus. So, this means that the ventricular septal defect is located not exactly in relation to the anterotricuspid commission. When we analyze the same defect in apical view, we identify a very thick muscular septum that is separating the ventricular septal defect from the aortic annulus, indicating that this is not a membranous VSD, but a high muscular ventricular septal defect. The anatomic size of the ventricular septal defect is smaller than the aortic annulus and so we know that it is a restrictive ventricular septal defect. The color flows in this epical four chamber view shows a large left right shunt from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. Even though the anatomic size of the ventricular septal defect is smaller than the aortic annulus, indicating that the VSD is restrictive, there is a substantial LA-LV dilatation which indicates that the left right shunt is substantial. On a parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate the same high muscular VSD very well. We can see that there is a thick region of muscular septum which is separating the aortic annulus from this ventricular septal defect. Color Doppler through this ventricular septal defect in the same parasternal long axis view shows a large flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. From these various views, we understand that this is a high muscular ventricular septal defect located about 78 millimeter away from the aortic annulus, separated from the aortic annulus by a thick muscular rib. Let us move on to more examples. This is a subsified short axis view. We can notice that there is an anterior muscular VSD, a ventricular septal defect that is located in the anterior muscular septum. On a subsified short axis view, when we visualize the entire interventricular septum, the margin of the interventricular septum that is closer to the transducer is the posterior margin of the interventricular septum. This will be in relation to the posterior descending coronary artery. The margin of the interventricular septum that is farther away from the transducer on a subsified short axis view is the anterior margin of the interventricular septum. This will be the region in close relation to the left anterior descending coronary artery. In this example, we can notice that the color flow is in the region of anterior margin of the interventricular septum. The same anterior muscular VSD is now shown in a parasternal short axis view. In a parasternal short axis view, the anterior margin of the interventricular septum is closer to the transducer. This is the region which is in close relation to the left anterior descending coronary artery. The posterior margin of the interventricular septum is the one that is farther away from the transducer and that is in relation to the posterior descending coronary artery. We can appreciate a large anterior muscular VSD in this parasternal short axis view. Color flows across the anterior muscular VSD 
in this parasternal short axis U shows a laminar flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle indicating the non-restrictive nature of these anterior muscular VSDs. On an epical view, we need to sweep the transducer far more anteriorly to visualize these anterior muscular VSDs. We can appreciate the anterior muscular VSD in this epical view with a complete anterior sweep of the transducer. Having seen an anterior muscular VSD, it will be interesting to see a posterior muscular ventricular septal defect to differentiate between the two. In this subsified short axis view, we notice a color flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricle through a large posterior muscular VSD. We can see the red flows across the interventricular septum which indicate the location of the posterior muscular VSD. As we described earlier, in a subsified short axis view, the posterior margin of the interventricular septum is located very close to the transducer. The anterior margin of the ventricular septal defect is located far away from the transducer. We can appreciate that the posterior muscular VSD is very large and so there is no pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. In the parasternal short axis view, we identify the posterior muscular VSD. In this view, the posterior margin of the interventricular septum is farther away from the transducer. The anterior margin of the interventricular septum is closer to the transducer. We notice that there is a lot of dynamic change in the size of the ventricular septal defect in systole and diastole. The size of the ventricular septal defect becomes much smaller in systole and widens out in diastole. When we are measuring these defects, we should freeze the frame in the end of diastole and try to get the largest diameter. Having seen both examples of anterior muscular VSD and posterior muscular VSD, we show certain still frames of a patient who had both these defects. In the first picture that is shown on the left side of the screen, we can see a red flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle on a subsified short axis view shown by two arrows. This represents on subsified short axis view a large posterior muscular VSD. In the picture seen in the middle, in the same patient on another subsified sweep, we have shown a color flow from the left ventricle towards the right ventricle in the anterior margin of the interventricular septum. This is an anterior muscular VSD, once again shown by two arrows, but here the color coding is blue because the flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricle through this anterior muscular VSD is away from the transducer. In the last picture that is seen on the right hand of the screen, we have pointed out both the anterior muscular VSD and posterior muscular VSD with two small arrows. So, this is an example of a heart with both anterior muscular and posterior muscular VSDs. We can appreciate from the last picture that the posterior muscular VSD is anatomically larger than the anterior muscular VSD. On a 3D unfast volume rendered view, we now visualize the entire interventricular septum from the right ventricular perspective. We can notice that the whole of the septum is like a triangle. The tricuspid valve leaflets are seen and the region adjacent to the sept tri septal tricuspid leaflet forms the inlet ventricular septum. We can appreciate the entire trabecular muscular septum and the outlet septum on the top. There are two arrows that point to the anterior muscular and the posterior muscular VSD which has been shown 
in the previous still frames. If we have to represent these two interceptal defects on a cartoon and explain these defects, we can notice that the posterior muscular VSD is located very, very, very close to the posterior margin of the ventricular septum and it's almost in the region of the inlet ventricular septum immediately below the crux of the heart. The crux of the heart is the region where the septal tricuspid leaflet's posterior margin almost blends with the posterior ends of the mitral annulus. It's the most posterior portion of the heart. We can notice that the anterior muscular VSD is located immediately below the horizontal band of the trabeculo marginalis. The anterior muscular VSD is located almost on the anterior interventricular groove. Having seen anterior muscular and posterior muscular VSDs, let us move on to some good examples of mid-muscular ventricular septal defects. In this subsified short axis view, we are seeing a large dropout in the ventricular septum in its mid portion. On the right ventricular side, we can appreciate a muscular structure that arises from the middle of the intraventricular septum and courses towards the right ventricular anterior wall. This denotes the moderator band of the right ventricle. The ventricular septal defect in this heart is located immediately posterior and inferior to the moderator band. On a subsified coronal view, we can see the dilated large left ventricle, the right ventricle and a large trabecular muscular ventricular septal defect. This is a large mid-muscular VST. Epical view shows this large muscular VSD very clearly. There is a left atrial and left ventricular dilatation indicating that there is a large left right shunt. On a parasternal short axis view, we see the interventricular septum and a large mid muscular ventricular septal defect. The horizontal band of structure that arises from the right ventricular portion of the interventricular septum and coursing towards the right ventricle anterior free wall is called as the moderator band. This large mid-muscular VSD is located posterior and inferior to the moderator band attachment. On a 3D ANFAS view, we can see the entire right ventricular septal surface. The whole of the ventricular septal defect is shown. This large mid-muscular VSD is located posterior and inferior to the attachments of the moderator band and we can appreciate its relation to the inlet septum, aortic valve, outlet septum very clearly on this 3D ANFAS view. The same ventricular septal defect that has been shown in these last five slides has been closed with a large septal occluder device. A 3D volume rendering of the right ventricular septal surface shows the anatomic location of the ventricular septal defect occluder device totally occluding that large muscular ventricular septal defect. Another example of ventricular septal defect in the trabecular muscular septum is shown in this subsified short axis view. We can notice the dilated left ventricle, multiple color dropouts 
seen in the intraventricular septum. There are at least four different regions where there is a color flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. This is an example of multiple muscular ventricular septal defect. Multiple ventricular septal defects in the trabecular and apical septum are described as Swiss cheese muscular ventricular septal defects. In this subsified short axis view, we can appreciate two small ventricular septal defects in the anterior portion of the ventricular septum having a blue color. The color is blue because the flow is away from the transducer. Posterior to these two defects, we can see two smaller defects which take a red color. So there are about four small defects in this sub short axis view between the left ventricle and right ventricle. On the apical view, we can see multiple color dropouts in the ventricular septum. There is flow from the left ventricle towards the right ventricle and there are multiple color jets. Having seen examples of isolated large anterior, posterior and mid-muscular ventricular septal defects and multiple Swiss cheese muscular ventricular septal defects, we will show some examples where there are perimembranous ventricular septal defects along with additional muscular ventricular septal defects. In this subsified short axis view, we can appreciate a large mid-muscular ventricular septal defect showing flows from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. The laminar red flows from the LV to RV indicate that the left ventricular and right ventricular systolic pressures are similar. On a subsified coronal view, we can appreciate a large perimembranous ventricular septal defect located immediately beneath the aortic valve. The mid-muscular ventricular septal defect seen in the previous subsified view is also well visualized in the middle of the ventricular septum. If you carefully observe, towards the apical portion of the ventricular septum, there is another moderate sized ventricular septal defects. So we are able to appreciate one large perimembranous ventricular septal defect one large mid-muscular ventricular septal defect and a moderate sized apical muscular ventricular septal defect. When we do a color Doppler interrogation on the same subsified coronal view, we are able to appreciate the color flows across the perimembranous ventricular septal defect on the left hand of the screen, the mid-muscular large ventricular septal defect in the middle of the screen and on the right side of the screen, we can appreciate a small color flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle through the epical second moderate sized muscular ventricular septal defect. The same example from an epical view, we can appreciate a large mid-muscular ventricular septal defect. There is also a perimembranous ventricular septal defect that is seen at the upper end of the screen. From the apex, when we move from a four chamber view to five chamber view, we appreciate the perimembranous ventricular septal defect located immediately below the aortic valve far better. On a parasternal short axis view, the large mid-muscular VSD is clearly defined. It's posterior to the moderator band. We can appreciate the moderator band as a continuation from the septal band on the interventricular septum to the anterior papillary muscle of the tricuspid valve which is seen attached to the anterior free wall of the right ventricle. In this frozen frame of the subsified coronal view which shows all the three ventricular septal defect, the large perimembranous ventricular septal defect is seen more cranially with a dotted arrow the large mid-muscular VSD is shown with a block arrow and the moderate sized epical ventricular septal defect is shown with a thin arrow. You can appreciate 
one perimembranous and two muscular ventricular septal defects, all in the same view. When we visualize the same three defects on a 3D on fast view, we can see the perimembranous ventricular septal defect immediately below the aortic valve, the large mid-muscular ventricular septal defect posterior to the septal band, and the epical moderate sized muscular VSD. All the three ventricular septal defects are shown and pointed out with the three arrows. The frozen frame from the 3D on fast view of the same example shows the perimembranous ventricular septal defect shown by a dotted arrow, the mid muscular ventricular septal defect shown by a block arrow, and the apical moderate sized muscular VSD shown by a thin arrow. An adjacent cartoon is a reproduction of the same 3D on fast view to give a better perspective. Some muscular ventricular septal defects can be very small. There is a very high possibility of spontaneous closure in these smaller muscular ventricular septal defects. We can appreciate in this epical view a small mid muscular ventricular septal defect. On a subsified short axis view, we can appreciate the same small mid muscular ventricular septal defect coursing across from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. Another example of a small apical muscular VSD seen once again from the subsified short axis view. This apical muscular VSD has been shown on the epical four chamber view. Some of the large muscular VSDs, especially in the epical portion, may be difficult to reach for surgery through the tricuspid valve. In this patient, it is common to resort to perventricular device closure of epical muscular ventricular septal defects. This is a transesophageal echocardiogram four chamber view of a large epical muscular ventricular septal defect. We can notice the interventricular septum is intact in the basal and mid trabecular septum. However, in the epical trabecular septum, there is a large ventricular septal defect. Perventricular device closures are done after sternotomy, opening the pericardial cavity and then directly having an access to the ventricular septal defect through the right ventricular anterior free wall. Before passing the needle from the right ventricular anterior free wall into the ventricular septal defect, we can do an epicardial echocardiogram. This is done by placing the standard thoracic echo probes over a sterile sleeve on the top of the right ventricle and viewing the ventricular septal defect from the anterior wall of the right ventricle. We can appreciate the large epical ventricular septal defect. During the procedure of perventricular ventricular septal defect closure, a needle is passed on the anterior wall of the right ventricle. A guide wire is advanced through the ventricular septal defect into the left ventricle. And a predetermined length of the introducer sheath is advanced through the guide wire into the ventricular septal defect. So that the tip of the introducer sheath reaches the left ventricle. A large muscular ventricular septal defect occluder device is chosen and the device is deployed through the introducer sheet. We can see here the left ventricular disc of the occluder device has been opened in the left ventricle. The entire ventricular septal occluder device has been deployed successfully and we can appreciate 
the LV disc and the RV disc in perfect position in relation to the plane of the interventricular receptor. This is a transgastric view of the transesophageal echocardiogram showing a good position of the perventricularly placed VSD device. The entire ventricular septal defect has been completely closed by the VSD device. We so far have seen extensive examples of perimembranous ventricular septal defects followed by outlet ventricular septal defects then moved on to inlet ventricular septal defects and different types of muscular ventricular septal defects. Let us now deal with some of the rarer types of ventricular septal defect. The gerbode ventricular septal defect is a defect in the portion of pars atrioventricularis of the membranous septum. We had described earlier that the membranous septum has got two components the pass atrioventricularis and the pass interventricularis. In other words, the membranous septum has got two divisions, one separating the right atrium from the left ventricle, which is called as the atrioventricular septum, and the lower portion is called as the interventricular portion of the membranous ventricular septum. If there is an anatomic defect in the atrioventricular portion of the septum, there will be a defect which will communicate from the left ventricle directly into the right atrium. This is called the direct gerbode defect. Here the flow will be from left ventricle to the right atrium. As there is a lot of pressure difference between the left ventricle and right atrium in systole, the shunt across this ventricular septal defect is called as obligatory shunt, which means Irrespective of the pulmonary vascular resistance, the shunt in systole will be from the left ventricle into the right atrium. In all the types of ventricular septal defects, the flow from the left ventricle to right ventricle is dependent on the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if the pulmonary vascular resistance becomes higher than the systemic vascular resistance, the flow will be from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So the direction of blood flow in a ventricular septal defect is conventionally called a dependent shunt, which means it is dependent on the ratio between the systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. However, in a gerbode ventricular septal defect, since the flow is from the left ventricle to the right atrium, a very high pressure chamber in systole, that is the left ventricle, to a low pressure chamber in systole, that is the right atrium, the shunt is obligatory and it is not dependent. In this subsifoid coronal view, we can appreciate a membranous ventricular septal defect located in very close relation to the tricuspid valve and the aortic annulus. However, if you see the color flows, the flow originates from the left ventricle and enters the right atrium. There is no color filling in the right ventricle at all. So the flow across this ventricular septal defect is entirely from the left ventricle into the right atrium. This is called direct gerbode type of ventricular septal defect. The same ventricular septal defect is now shown in a modified apical view. We can appreciate the flow from the most superior portion of the left ventricle immediately below the aortic valve leaflets directly going into the right atrium. There is no filling of the right ventricle at all. These direct gerbode defects where there is a defect in the pars atrioventricularis of the membranous septum or in other words the atrioventricular septum is very very rare. These types of ventricular septal defects are very rarely seen in clinical practice. The same gerbode defect is now shown on a parasternal short axis view. The region of the atrioventricular portion of the membranous septum has been magnified in this view. 
we can see the left ventricular outflow tract with the aortic valve leaflets we can see the right ventricle inflow portion the tricuspid valve leaflets and see a flow originating from the left ventricle directly entering the right atrium there is no flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle at all this is a classical direct type of gerbaud defect there is another type of gerbaud ventricular septal defect which is called as the indirect type of gerbaud ventricular septal defect here through a perimembranous ventricular septal defect there is a flow of blood from the left ventricle into the right ventricle since the membranous ventricular septal defect is anatomically located in the region of anteroseptal tricuspid commissure some portion of the blood which is shunted from the left ventricle to the right ventricle courses through the anteroseptal tricuspid commissure towards the right atrium so here the flow of the blood will be from left ventricle to right ventricle initially through the membranous septal defect and then from right ventricle to right atrium through the anteroseptal tricuspid commission the ultimate blood flow will be from left ventricle to right ventricle into the right atrium and so this will be called as an indirect type of gerbaud defect on this subsified view of this patient we can notice the blood flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle through the membranous septal defect we can notice the membranous septal defect is in very close relation to the aortic valve annulus there is a small aneurysm of the membranous septum formed by the septal tricuspid leaflet however a portion of the color jet is also entering the right atrium and this is what is described as an indirect type of gerbaud ventricular septal defect on this apical view we can appreciate the perimembranous ventricular septal defect the flow of blood from the left ventricle initially towards the right ventricle and subsequently it gets directed through the anteroseptal tricuspid commission into the right atrium this is indirect gerbaud defect parasternal short axis view is the best view to appreciate these indirect gerbaud defects this view delineates the membranous septum the attachments of the septal tricuspid leaflets the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve very clearly so the blood flow from the left ventricle initially into the right ventricle and subsequently through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium will all be defined far more clearly in this modified parasternal short axis view we can appreciate a restrictive membranous ventricular septal defect with an initial flow of the blood from the left ventricle into the right ventricle however the vsd jet is entirely directed through the tricuspid valve leaflets into the right atrium constituting an left ventricle to right atrium indirect type of gerbaud phenomenon when we magnify the region of the membranous septum on a parasternal short axis view we appreciate the flow of the blood from the left ventricle initially to the right ventricle and then getting directed through the tricuspid valve leaflets into the right atrium contributing for this indirect gerbaud phenomenon some of the ventricular septal defects are formed due to the malalignment of different portions of the ventricular septum when large ventricular septal defects in the region of membranous septum are associated with varying degrees of malalignment between the infundibular septum and the trabecular septum the aortic valve will appear to override these defects this is the classical case of tetralogy of fallow and some instances of double outlet right ventricle similarly there can be a posterior malalignment of the coronal septum producing a subaortic stenosis this parasternal long axis view shows a large membranous ventricular septal defect at the superior end of the ventricular septal defect 
the small conal septum is anteriorly deviated. This results in a malalignment between the trabecular septum seen below and the conal septum seen above. This is called a malaligned VST. This anterior malalignment of the conal septum can produce varying degrees of right ventricular outflow tract obstructions. Whenever there is a malalignment between the conal septum and the trabecular septum, one of the semilunar valves will appear to override the ventricular septal defect. In this example, the aortic valve overrides into the right ventricle. This will be described as around 30% aortic override. That means 30% of the aortic annulus is committed to the right ventricle and the remaining 70% is committed to the left ventricle. You can notice that there is an anatomic fibrous continuity between the aortic annulus and the mitral annulus seen in the region of the attachments of the anterior mitral leaflet. This attachment of the anterior mitral leaflet's basal portion to the aortic annulus is called as aortomitral fibrous continuity. This region is called as the aortomitral curtain. We can notice in this color Doppler on parasternal long axis view the flow of the blood from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. Parasternal short axis view of the same anterior malaligned ventricular septal defect shows that the level of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by the minimal anterior malalignment is not very significant. So there is no right ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by this minimal anterior deviation of the conal septum. We can appreciate the normal sized infundibulum and a good moving pulmonary valve. However, if the anterior malalignment of the conal septum is far more significant, it will narrow the right ventricular outflow tract and narrow the region of the infundibulum. This will result in severe infundibular stenosis as in the case of tetralogy of fallow. In this example of anterior malalignment of the conal septum, there is far more severe infundibular narrowing. This is a subsified coronal view that shows the infundibular narrowing caused by the anterior malalignment of the conal septum. There is more turbulence in the right ventricular outflow tract. On a subsified short axis view, we can appreciate that there is more significant anterior malalignment of the conal septum and more turbulence in the right ventricular outflow tract caused by increasing degrees of malalignment and increasing anterior deviations of the conal septum. Let us move on to the hemodynamic assessment of ventricular septal defects on echocardiogram. If you notice a left atrial and left ventricular dilatation, that is an indicator of a large shunt from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. The shunt through the ventricular septal defect will go through the pulmonary artery and return through the pulmonary vein and cause a volume overload of the left atrium and left ventricle. However, before deciding that the left atrial and left ventricular dilatation are caused by the shunt through the ventricular septal defect, we should exclude other reasons for left atrial and left ventricular enlargement. Some of the common causes are associated mitral valve regurgitation, an associated large aortopulmonary window or a large patent ductus arteriosus. If these conditions are excluded, the presence of left atrial and left ventricular dilatation is a direct evidence of large shunt through the ventricular septal defect. On color flow Doppler, we can also see the shunting pattern, whether it is left to right or right to left. The interventricular gradient recorded by either a spectral Doppler or a continuous wave Doppler will be an indicator of the right ventricular systolic pressure. If the right ventricular systolic pressure is almost similar to the left ventricular systolic pressure, the interventricular gradient 
will be less than 10. The pulmonary hypertension in ventricular septal defect can be hyperkinetic pulmonary hypertension in large ventricular septal defects due to large left right shunt or in later stages be a fixed pulmonary hypertension where the pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated and the flow across the ventricular septal defect is bidirectional. We can also see the effect of additional lesions like atrial septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, coctation and mitral regurgitation. On a subsifoid short axis view, we appreciate the marked dilatation of the left atrium compared to the right atrium. The intraatrial septum bows into the right atrium. This left atrial enlargement is a feature of high flows through the ventricular septal defect. Epical view shows enlargement of the left atrium left ventricle and an accelerated anti-grade flow through the mitral valve. These are all signs of large left right shunt through the ventricular septal defects. Because of left ventricular dilatation and mitral annular dilatation, it is not very uncommon to see mild degrees of functional mitral regurgitation caused by the mitral annular dilatation. On a M mode cut taken through the aortic root and the left atrium, we can notice that the left atrium is much more larger compared to the aortic root and this is a sign of large left right shunt through a ventricular septal defect. Again an M mode cut through the left ventricle will give an idea about the significance of left ventricular dilatation. The left ventricular dimensions in systole and diastole can be compared through the normal values of left ventricular internal dimension in systole and diastole from the nomograms and the z-scores of the left ventricle assessed to see the level of enlargement of the left ventricle. When we look at the color flows from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, very brisk color flows are also an indicator of large shunt from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. Color Doppler interrogation of the flow across the intraventricular septum will show the extent of left right shunt. In this example, there is a laminar color flow from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. An uniform red color that indicates the left right shunt is happening at very very minimal intraventricular pressure gradients. In this subsified coronal view, we can notice the color flows from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. We can notice that there are phases during which there is a right to left shunt also, which is shown by a blue color. The color flows are not as brisk as the previous example. These are indicators that the pulmonary vascular resistance is higher in these patients. This phenomenon will be called as Eisenmengerization of a ventricular septal defect. On a spectral Doppler or a continuous wave Doppler, if we get an intraventricular gradient, it will give an indication about the relative differences between the right ventricular and left ventricular systolic pressures. When the intraventricular gradient exceeds 4 meters per second, or exceeds 64 millimeters of mercury. These are indicators that the pulmonary artery pressures will be near normal. However, if we get a very high gradient across a perimembranous ventricular septal defect, we should look for causes of left ventricular outflow tract obstructions like coarctation. In this example, we are seeing an intraventricular gradient of 171 millimeters of mercury, which is not a physiological value of difference between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And so we should try to exclude a coarctation. We would like to reiterate that in some of the subpulmonary ventricular septal defects, since the defect is located very, very anteriorly 
and the VSD jet is directly in line with the transducer when we place it on a parasternal view. In subpulmonary VSDs, there may be an overestimation of the interventricular gradients and values can be seen like 140 to 160 millimeters of mercury even in the absence of coarctation. When the pulmonary vascular resistance progressively rises, there is a gradual enlargement of the right atrium and right ventricle and loss of the left ventricular volume overload. In this patient with a large perimembranous VSD, you can appreciate that the right ventricle and left ventricle are more or less similar in the sizes. This increase in size of the right ventricle and reduction in the volume overload of the left ventricle will be an indirect indicator of increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. When we visualize the color flow pattern through the ventricular septal defect from an apical view, we can notice that there is a clear bidirectional shunt across the ventricular septal defect. These are indicators of high pulmonary vascular resistance. These VSDs are described as Eisenmenger VSDs. In the echocardiogram lab, if we start administering oxygen in these patients with high pulmonary vascular resistance for about 10 to 15 minutes, we can slowly notice the reversal of the shunt. Previously, the shunt was bidirectional. However, after about 15 minutes of oxygen, there is an increasing left-right shunt. We can appreciate that the, on this parasternal short axis view, there is more of a red color from the left ventricle into the right ventricle through a large membranous ventricular septal defect. When we interrogate the color flows across the right ventricular outflow tract in large ventricular septal defects with large pulmonary flows, it is not very uncommon to have mild turbulence across the pulmonary valve. This is due to a large QP. This may not indicate an anatomic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The turbulence across the pulmonary valve is due to high flows caused by the high QP bar cures ratio. VST closures can be done either surgically or through catheter route. The catheter route is restricted to only smaller and moderate sized ventricular septal defects. Large ventricular septal defects present in early infancy and so often require surgical closure. This is an epical four chamber view of a patient who had a patch closure of a large membranous ventricular septal defect. There is a dehiscence of the patch at the upper end which is resulting in a residual ventricular septal defect. We can appreciate the thick echogenic patch seen attached to the caudal edge of the ventricular septal defect. However, there is a dehiscence in the cranial end of the ventricular septal defect. 